Hi everyone, my name is Essie Ogene Adams and I'm a Gender and Inclusion Advisor with the Policy Innovation Center. And with me this today, I have two gentlemen to carry on this conversation. Can we meet you, please? Hi, my name is Akimumi Akiola. I lead the Behavioral Insights work within Policy Innovation Center. It's great to be here. You're welcome. Yeah, um, thank you, Essie. Um, my name is um, Cornelius Ohansi. Um, I support the policy and advocacy work at the Policy Innovation Center. Thank you, Anna All right, you're welcome. Uh, so today we'll just be building up uh, on a conversation that's already started you know, during the Gender and Inclusion Summit 2023. And um, uh, it talked about, you know, my certificate is not a meal ticket. And, you know, a lot of conversations ensued that uh, during that session, talked about um, the issues and challenges that Nigerian youths face you know, the dilemma, um, is my certificate sufficient for me to make a livelihood? And you, you found out that a lot of people graduate from school and end up not even working with their certificates. And so uh, as a result of that, uh, there are a lot of perceptions around education. Is it worth it? Do we still want to go to school? Or we just go ahead and, you know, do what uh, we like? So today we'll be building on that conversation and... Um, our topic, the topic that will be guiding this conversation is uh, shaping youth ambitions, the role of educational policies, program, and technology. So um, I'll be starting with you, uh, Mr. Akin Wumi. Um, so you've been around for a while. So what has obs your observation been around educational policies and programs? You know, um, have they been gender inclusive? Have they really been effective, you know, in shaping um, educational mentality in Nigeria. Okay, thank you, Ese. Um, I think we have pretty good educational policies. Um, um, one that comes to mind uh, most obviously is the National Policy on Education that eventually uh, metamorphosed and became the Universal Basic Education Policy of 2004. And I think that policy has very good provisions in terms of ensuring good quality accessible um, education for um, school-aged children um, and i think that intention itself is good um, it also has some provisions that uh, is expected to facilitate the systems to respond to that so you have the universal basic education commission that is supposed to respond directly to um, interventions with regards to that um, however the policy has some lacuna um, and there has been arguments and counter arguments around the justiciability of it because this is a policy you can't hold government um, responsible. You can't sue government um, and parents for the absence of a child in the school. Um, and that begs the question, how do you now want to effectively track the implementation of a policy that gives room for government to absorb in itself of um, the responsibility, since this is supposed to be a human right. Education is supposed to be a human right. So there is that argument that the policy gives room um, for that opportunity. Um, however, I think the thinking and the concept around ensuring that school age children are kept in school um, up to basic three, GSS3 in Nigerian context, I think is a fantastic idea um, because it increases their future outcomes. However, being in school, and learning in school is also another ball game entirely. Uh, but I think it's a fantastic provision, fantastic policy in itself altogether. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Akin. So we have looked at um, basic education, right? So um, um, Dr. Hansi, so I'll be asking you, so looking at um, our youth, okay, so how do you think, because most of this policy now basically covers the basic education as it were. So uh, what's the implication for uh, young people who come from very low socioeconomic background that have to pay, you know, from their pockets, you know, to fund their education? So what's the implication, you know, around that? Um, okay, thank you very much. Um, interesting question. Um, I, I, I want to um, start um, bottom up. Um, so even looking at the UBE, um, we have um, states where you hear things around um, that education is free and compulsory. Okay. And the extent to which this free education is not quantified, 
Mm-hmm. And because we had situations where we're involved in a project or we're involved in projects across the country, like the ACP project, which was the out of school children um, program. And um, part of what we saw in some states was that um, while the impression is that education was free, it wasn't free in its totality because they still had to bring in some money. So it was basically subsidized education being sold as um, um, free education. Mm-hmm. That said, um, I think we need to differentiate schooling from education. Okay. Um, there's we're, we're low and in, um, low and medium income country, but when you begin to look at how much we spend on airtime, for example, mm-hmm. um, I think it's about priority. Okay. Um, you know, so if I go back to ACP again, so a parent um, doesn't have two thousand naira to pay for you for a book for books, mm-hmm. um, but so I get the opportunity to ask the parents, how much do you spend in a month? For airtime, so I think it's about priority. And with time in Nigeria, um, educating the children has—it's not in the front burner for parents anymore, um, because we've had um, people who um, have used social vice and gotten quicker wealth without education. Um, so I think we first of all have to separate schooling because I think basically what we have more profoundly in country is schooling School. are the people are they really educated because we're not getting the we're not getting the 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 return on investment okay. for education because if you go to school let's say you have a university education i usually jokingly we say you go to the university to learn the universe okay. but you now find people who go to the university and they don't put anything on themselves mm. and so it's it's i know because if you look worldwide you see our education here is pretty cheap it's really really cheap government is subsidizing a lot for education so i i, I think we have to requantify our poverty because i think it's about priority we don't for the parents most times um, maybe there are children in the area who haven't gone to school that well and they are doing well through other means and they want their own children to toe that line um make an example can't you see today can't you see this other person and so i know it's difficult because we still have people we have stories you know people who were not trained by their parents but they went through school put something on themselves and today they are something so i think it's about separating schooling from education priorities for the parents priority for the youths value system value system have changed over the years thank you all right, so I'm um, still building on that. Um, I agree, it's, uh, sometimes it's a matter of priority, but we still have people, particularly if we're looking at uh, marginalized population, we still have people who want to be educated. It's a priority for them, right? But they have still not been able to access um, educational opportunities. So what do you have to say about that? We can start with Mr. So what are some of the barriers specifically you know, for those who have prioritized education. So how, how, how does all of this affect their, you know, their career aspiration? Because there are people, if you meet some young people now, they have a lot of career aspirations. So what, what do you think would be responsible for um, that challenge? Okay, so um, he has identified one, which is not um, putting premium or value on or appreciating um, what's education means or what it comes with or the, the value on education, particularly not necessarily the children now, their parents, because yeah. it's the parents that determine ultimately um, the need and necessity to go to school or not. Okay. Right. However, that said, you also have, like you rightly said, the people who are willing and have intent to um, school, but don't have the means. Mm. Truth be told, Yes, we've been talking about um, free basic education, but in Nigeria, there are several accounts of um, hidden fees okay. across the school, across schools um, nationwide. Mm. And so um, I think one thing you need to do, particularly knowing that if you are talking about marginalized people, you are talking about people with poor socioeconomic indices, you are exactly. talking about women, you are talking about uh, pe- people that are differently abled now. Um, so if you look at that, there are many approaches to address it. One is, for instance, to remove the hidden fees. Okay. And I know that it, it, it was contained in one of the ministerial plans, I think, that ended in 2022 uh, within the Federal Ministry of Education to 
actually remove all hidden fees. Um, however, there are evidence that, you know, accounts that that is still existent in, in some schools across the nation. So remove the hidden fees and let education be free in its entirety. Okay. That is one. Two is the need for value reorientation. Um, it's not enough for you to want to go to school. You also need role modeling. For instance, you talked about gender inclusivity of this. How many female teachers do we have? Can they role model? Um, can they? Can the a student? Can a female student find confidence in a female teacher? Can they be mentored? Can they be appropriately? If you compare the ratio in terms of gender ratio for teachers, you see that there's still a lot of gender gap in terms of um, teachers, uh, female teachers in in in, in uh, primary schools particularly, right? So you need role modeling. An interesting finding from this study he, he mentioned is that we we saw that in some parts, for instance, of the southeast, norms, social norms, particularly gender norms, now played a role. Okay. So, for instance, we had um, situations where teaching profession was unattractive to male teachers, okay. right? So you had the preponderance of female teachers in second in primary schools because they felt the wage could be um, is acceptable for a woman who doesn't have so much responsibility in court. Okay. But for a man who is supposed to be a man of the house, mm -hmm. who has you know almost all the burden financially, mm -hmm. call it messianic syndrome, like I want to solve all the problems. The burden of responsibility. Um, drives the men to abscond from teaching as a profession, particularly in the Southeast. So you will find that if you go to like 10 schools, you will find that maybe hardly would you find six schools that has fairly good ratio of male to female teachers. Okay. Right? So that already is a gap. So you need to also invest in um, gender approach to education, which means that you have to invest in uh, the education of the girl child, you also have to invest in um, producing good quality female teachers. And that's the gender approach to it. Knowing that if you invest in a girl child, you are solving a lot of problems, not just education. You are solving health problems. You are solving income generation problems. You are solving uh, decision-making problems. And it's, it's a holistic package in all, thinking about it in terms of the life course approach. Mm -hmm. And that itself will help you to address uh, the problem of um, inclusion for out of school. There are many other approaches like investing in uh, ramps for um, education institutions and all of that. But um, these are just a few ways that you can directly approach uh, the gaps in terms of inclusion for these marginalized people. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you have a few points to add. You have talked about role modeling. Um, he has also talked about you know removing hidden fees and um, also a more gender inclusive approach. Um, do you have any other one you'd like to add to that? Um, it's um, I think he, he said something about norms. Um, I think um, one very important thing is our value system. Okay. Um, value. What what do we place value on? Um, so for most of us in the room. Um, we grew up in um, areas where we had, maybe we're in a staff quarters or um, we're, we're in an area where we saw academics. Mm -hmm. And this loops into the role modeling thing. We wanted to be like those people. And, but right now, it, the value system is different. Um, you see maybe in country, the people who are more valued or more respected are the politicians. And when you go back, you go back, you see these people, they didn't have proper schooling. You see, maybe the may, when we were growing up, the vice chancellor of a university was a very, was a highly respected um, person mm -hmm. in the community. But I don't think that's what it is right now. Um, all, I think for me, I just want to bring out that value system. system. We need to, we need to re rejig and realign our value system um, so that the, the youths will have something to look up to. Uh, because there's been a destruction of our value system as a country. All right. Thank you so much. So we have looked at value system, redefining our value system, you know, removing hidden fees, 
a more gender and inclusive approach and then role modeling. All right, great. Thank you so much. So quickly, Dr. Hansi, um, we are now in a more a digital inclined um, 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 world, as it were. So um, how can technology be harnessed to foster inclusive learning environment, you know, and also empower individuals? You know, people come from different backgrounds. So how do we want to ensure that everybody is carried along digitally? Uh, so um, for, like you, you've pointed out, um, most of the things we now do are IT-driven, data-driven. Okay. Um, so there's something known as digital public infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And when you are able to set DPI, you, 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 you kind of increase access because everybody through, for example, fiber optics, are able to get access to the internet. Okay. And um, something I like to point out is, you know, if you are a, if someone is, it, your, your, 15 years old, you said your parents didn't train you. You became 25 years old and you say your parents didn't train you. At that time, it's not your fault. Okay. Um, because there are people who started going to school when they were 40 years old. So that's that um, you didn't get the necessary support to go to school. That mm -hmm. is not the reason. The internet right now is a school on its own. All you need right now are um, employable skills. Um, because like Akin will agree with me sometimes, um, we're looking for skills in the whole of the country. Mm. And if like, we're, we're, we're 200 million people and we're looking for particular skills in country and most of the time, we, we don't find those things. We don't find those things in country. And there are no things you study in the university. I like to point to our syllabus or curriculum. You know, it's really, really outdated because the problems, for example, in PIC that we want to solve, I doubt there's any Nigerian university that can produce the graduates that can feed to the solutions that we want to uh, provide. So there's, there, there's an issue around even the curriculum. In. Then I am um, for, 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 for digital, you know, so looking at um, I inclusivity, we have to be able to develop platforms where even people, the blind, the blind can assess education, the educational platform. There are speech to text, speech to text. There are other kind of ways where we can make it accessible. I've talked about um, DPI, making it accessible to both rural, and the um, urban people. Then we, ha we have teacher training services. Teacher training services, now you can, through the World Bank, we have services, you have states that have World Bank projects where mm -hmm. the, um, the teachers are handed tablets and through those tablets, they're kind of, they're kind of being taught as they are teaching those people. Mm -hmm. And evaluation of those programs have shown that the teachers improved after like 19 months. The mm -hmm. teachers became better using a particular um, standard syllabus and using a tool, an IT tool. So I, I feel this this um, really helps people to assess. But the, the internet is right now has everything that you need to learn. Sure. So if you really want to learn, the internet is there for you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So uh, we are rounding up now. So um, Can I just weigh okay. in on what he just said? All right. So within the Policy Innovation Center, for instance, we know that learning is not just peculiar to school-age children, right? So we know that there's also adult learning. Um, um, one of the ways that we are promoting that, for instance, we have a program that is supported by Mercator Foundation where we are building the capacity of CSOs and uh, civil society organizations and uh, uh, policy makers, civil servants around how to use behavioral insights to respond and address corruption issues, right? And so we know that to democratize learning so that people can access it and it is self-paced, we, we, we decided to put it online in a learning management system such that um, people can self-learn their, at their pace and without any hassle or obstructions, what have you. Mm -hmm. However, the angle I wanted to bring in is to make it more inclusive, you also have to consider things like the speech-to-text thing, right? Such that if... Um, if somebody, for instance, has a preference, even if he's not blind um, or is not disabled in quote in the five categories of disability, um, you also know that some people who just have preferences around learning. So some people prefer to read text. Some people are very kinesthetic. They want to see the the motion and the interaction, yeah. you know, audiovisual and all of that. So. We have varied the approaches such that in one video you have it also converted to text, 
right? And it's easier for somebody who, for instance, is blind, right? Mm -hmm. um, a blind person may not be able to see the video, but the person can hear, yeah. Yeah. right? Um, for for instance, somebody who who is in, um, let's say, in transit, and you cannot visually you are in a public place, so you don't want to learn by the audiovisual. You can decide to read, and that is part of inclusion, right? So those are some of the ways to uh, link digital learning to inclusion and make sure that everybody is not left behind. All right, thank you so much. So um, I will just get your final words from you. So we've said a lot of things today. So how do you think we can you know, actually achieve some of these things that we have talked about? You know, how can stakeholders collaborate to ensure that we are redefining education properly and that people's value system are being, you know, re-enlightened as it were. So how do we plan to achieve all of this? So we can start with Dr. Hansi. Um, so I think uh, we need to look at it. I think our, 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 our focus has just been formal education, formal education. There are other forms of education, okay. um, vocational education. Mm -hmm. um, not everybody needs to go to university as it, as it were right now. Mm -hmm. There are, are polytechnics, there are technical um, colleges. I think um, those are most of the um, hand-on things. You know, you hear things like Nigerian um, graduates are not employable uh, because the hands-on, um, I want to solve a problem. I don't, I'm not interested in your paper you're bringing. I want to solve a problem. What skills do you have in your hand to solve that problem? I think we need to go in more into vocational education. Maybe if we pay more attention to that and um, get the plumber as in to get some education about what he's doing, I think you're going to earn more from that, the carpenter too. I think if we put more time um, getting people coming out for secondary school, because actually we've talked about those who really want to go. There are those that don't want to go. To go yeah. Yeah. They want to. If you give them the option of vocational education, they will be. And mm -hmm. at um, and at the point that you get them schooling, they might now get educated. educated. So um, thank you. That that much. All right. Say thank you, Mr. Aki. Okay. I I think that there is quite a lot to be done in terms of responding to education challenges in Nigeria. First, address the problem of out of school. Right now, um, the figures you know being banned in the around is between ten million and eighteen million. But one thing is very important. You need to um, use a grassroots approach to address and promote enrollment of um, children, particularly the girl child, into schools at the minimum, the basic education that is recommended um, by government. I think that is one, one way to um, significantly move the needle in terms of education. The second thing is around the quality of education. A lot of young people are school day children are in school and they are not learning. The crisis is grave. I can tell you learning poverty is in Nigeria is beyond 80%, which means that there are people who are around the age figure of age 10 and by the uh, time they are finishing their primary school, they cannot understand a, a complete text right? They can't yeah. comprehend it. And that's a serious crisis. So we need to invest in the quality of education at the basic level, yeah. especially uh, the numeracy and the, 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 the literacy. Yes, I, I think it's very important to focus on that. And then last thing is to invest in the systems that make this work, from teachers to school buildings. Even if when you want to promote the ACP study he talked about, you when you bring in people in some states, when you try to bring in people even for vocational teaching and all of these adult arrangements, there is no infrastructure to accommodate them. So you need to invest in facility and infrastructure and enable the system to perform. Wow. It has been an interesting conversation today. And um, if you still like to know more about what we do, you can follow us on our social media platforms and also visit our website. Thank you for listening. Bye.